you're able, uh, we'll stand for the reading of God's word. This week it's coming from Romans 12. Let, the lo- let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. All right, at this time I'll ask Pastor Billy to come up and we'll pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning, Lord. And Lord, I'm just grateful for everyone that's here this morning. We're grateful for the multitude of voices that we're singing, uh, the harmony that um, we were just able to share in praising you this morning, Lord. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, in this time, um, as we begin to, to dive into the word that Billy's prepared and the message that you have um, to come through to us, Lord, we just ask that just as we all had individual voices, Lord, you'd speak to us individually um, and help build this body that we can be of your service in the next week, Lord. We thank you, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. So I was joking with Kyle this morning um, that it was five years ago that we had a few folks over in our living room to dream about seeing a church begin in this city. And now, five years later, here we are. Pretty wild, all the things that God has done. We did not know there'd be a global pandemic, right, as we were getting started. Um, We did not know all the things that God would do. It's been incredible. So I am more than excited this morning to gather and talk to you. We're in the middle of a sermon series that we've called, Look What God Has Done. This is a series where we're looking at our core values and we're we're talking about who we are as a church and who we hope to become as a church. And one of the reasons I love the church of Jesus Christ is that when people get together who have no business being together, that displays the hope of Jesus. It's beautiful when people who shouldn't be friends become brothers. When people who don't usually get along all of a sudden become deeply connected. I kind of want to mention to you guys a couple friends of mine, Nathan and Sarah. So back when I first got married, I was living in the Midwest. I grew up here, but was kind of out of my element, had just gotten married and was young and Clueless, and some friends invited us over. Well, they weren't friends yet. Some folks invited us over for dinner. And as a young married person, I think I was like 24 at the time, I was like, sweet, free food, I'm in, right? We went over and we were excited. And it was this cold, snowy day in January of 2015. And I was a little bit older than that, actually. Forget it, doesn't matter. Point is, Nathan managed, uh, Nathan had invited me over and we pull up and we're driving. And this is like, no offense to my friends who live out there. This is like going to Kaiser. You know, we're like, we, we keep driving from Columbia and we're thinking, oh, it's like a 15 minute drive. Oh, it's like a 20 minute drive. Oh, it's like a 25 minute drive. Where are we going? We pull up to this old farmhouse that's been renovated. And my friend Nathan greets me. Nathan was a really awesome guy, a little bit older, had three kids His wife, Sarah and him, both were just kind of different than us. Nathan managed a bakery at a local grocery store. Sarah was a stay-at-home mom with a side gig as a jazzercise instructor. So we had a ton in common. And um, I remember them inviting us in. And if you know both me and Hannah, you might wonder, how in the world did you guys mesh? Like, why did you hang out together? Well, quite simply put, they invited us over. They invited us over, and we walked in, and I don't know if you've ever, if you can recount like a time that you've experienced unbelievable hospitality. It it really hits you in a way that is kind of hard to describe. It's like you don't want to leave. You're just having such a good time. We walk in, and there's this roaring fire in the fireplace. There's a basket with warm bread in it. I'm like, who does this? This is great. It's like we're at a restaurant. There's all this amazing food, and somehow in the, mix, in the mix of all of this, there's me, who's the extrovert of extroverts. You know, Murray joked about this before. There's Nathan, who's this quiet, introspective introvert, and here we are just talking together. And before I knew it, we were laughing and dreaming. I was like, man, this is incredible. We walked in their backyard. They've got three acres of this beautiful land, and I'm like, you guys should host. And they're like, yeah, you know, we've thought about it. Well, fast forward and more conversations happen and more dinners happen. And before you know it, we start having 
bonfires out at their place. There's silly theme parties. There's church retreats. There's dinners. There's concerts and more, all hosted by this hospitable, sacrificial family. There's believers and not yet believers who are standing on the patio, laughing together, feeling relaxed. And I remember standing there and Nathan looks at me and he goes, hey man, you did this. I was like, nobody, you did this because you welcomed us in with hospitality, with grace. They valued hospitality so much that they opened their home all the time. They welcomed missionary teams from Brazil, community groups, friends of friends to stay and to use their home. They made such a massive impact on Hannah and I. And in fact, just to be honest, many of us, Daniel and Lori, as they're looking to buy a house now, the thing that they keep saying is, we want to get a place so we can be like Nathan and Sarah. We want to welcome people into our home. We want to be hospitable. You see, hospitality, it resonates with you. When you experience it, you, you, you want to experience it again. I mean, it makes the difference between a good restaurant and a great restaurant. It, it makes the difference between whether you want to go back to that person's house or if the next time maybe you'll host when you get together. So today I want to zero in on this idea of hospitality. Again, we're in the midst of a series called Look What God Has Done. We're, we're celebrating two churches coming together as one new church, Mission Church, and we're looking at our values as a church. And I want to pull this up for you guys just to kind of, I know this may seem a little bit like are we in a membership class. This is a little different than what we typically do with expositional preaching, but I think it's important to set the precedent for who we hope to become. So here is our mission as a church, that we would live on mission for Christ kingdom. What's our vision? What do we hope to see? Well, we hope to see Morganton, Burke County, and beyond transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to put up this other amazing graphic about uh, mission and vision. It's this chart. So this looks so much better. Back in the day when we, I did this sermon when we first started, which by the way, I preached on hospitality the last time I did this was in February of 2020. Bummer, right? So hopefully nothing weird happens. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> You've got this really unique picture up here. What in the world is going on? Michael jokingly calls it a swimming pool. That's not what it is. So in this green square, you've got mission. Okay, that's our identity. That's what we, we do, right? We want to make much of Christ's kingdom. It's the Great Commission, really, repackaged and contextualized for us. So that's our mission. We want to make much of Jesus. We want to live on mission for Christ's kingdom. What's our vision? Well, we just said it, right? It's that we want to see Morganton, Burke County, and beyond transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that little squiggly line in between your mission and your vision is what we call our strategy. In other words, the things that we do, right? The stuff that we try. It's like when we, this past summer, we did the, the neighborhood cookouts, and we invited our neighborhood to come and, and, and to get to know us, and we made a lot of food, or when we did the fall festival, and we celebrated with lots of people, and we had a giant bounce house in the back, all that. You know, we're trying to connect. We're trying to build relationships so that we can share the hope of Jesus. That's our strategy. The problem is most churches have a clear idea of what their mission is and a clear idea of what their vision is, but no clue how to get there. And they'll try this. They'll try that. They'll try this thing. And their strategy will go all over the place. And so what keeps us reined in, what keeps us boxed in, as it were, so that we can stay on mission is our core values. So today, we're looking at the value of hospitality. And that might seem like a strange value to you. And I hope, as we look at God's word, that it will illuminate your understanding of hospitality. So here's how we have defined it as a value. Hospitality. In unity and love, we cultivate a culture where all find a place, a purpose, and a warm embrace in God's grace. Hospitality, friends, is a huge deal in the life of the believer. As far back as you want to go in the history of God's people, one of the God-appointed duties of the righteous is hospitality. If we go all the way back to Genesis and we look at Abraham when angels appear, what does he do? They say, oh, we, you know, don't go out of your way. Don't do a lot. You know, they're thinking he's going to get a cup of lemonade. And he goes out and he's like, kill the fattened calf, prepare a huge feast, right? He's like, we're going to give them hospitality. Here's what we mean by hospitality, the willingness to welcome people into your life, into your home who don't ordinarily belong there. 
In the New Testament, this duty is re-emphasized. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12 is outlining what a Christian life looks like. It starts with this idea that we are living sacrifices, right? Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed. And then he goes through, he talks about the gifts of grace that God has given. And then he finally goes to our text where he talks about the mark of a true Christian, that our love is genuine, right? That we don't, we, we, we hate, we abhor what is evil. We hold fast to what is good. We love each other with a brotherly, a familial affection. We outdo each other in showing honor, right? And look at verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Literally, it's, it's saying pursue hospitality. In other words, what that means, it's implying a continuous action. It's not a one and done thing. It's an all of life thing. In the days of the book of Romans, Christians quite literally needed hospitality. They couldn't go and like go and share the gospel and, and, and do the work of evangelism and then just book a hotel. No, they were ostracized. They were looked down on, often crucified and lit on fire. So they quite literally depended on the hospitality of the saints. The command in Romans 12, verse 13, is that hospitality is not just a one-time, flash-in-the-pan, entertain guests sort of thing. It's not just a once a year at Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's this constant attitude and practice. So our Sunday morning service, our homes should stand constantly ready for gracious hospitality for this readiness to welcome people who don't ordinarily live, dwell, inhabit those spaces. One way I've heard hospitality explained is the art of making people want to stay without interfering with their departure. I love that. Each of our values, we're going to focus on the church gathered, that is the church corporate, all of us together, and then the church scattered when we go out into our spaces and places, our homes So as we look at this idea, we're going to start first with what it looks like as the church gathered. The church gathered together as God's people. So let's start first with this idea of hospitality gathered. We define this value as the church gathered by saying this, devoting ourselves to one another as a family by sharing meals, welcoming others as we study God's word and celebrate his grace. So as we look at our passage in Romans 12, again, Paul's writing about a new life, one that is a life full of worship. That's something that we're going to talk about in the week to come. He's saying that this translates into us being a part of a new community, that we have new relationships, that we are called into a kingdom, called to be a church of the living God. See, God is not just in the business of saving individuals to himself. He is saving a people to himself, a family, a body of believers who live interdependently for the sake of one another. And so what that means is we are committed to a local body of believers. And that means that we are genuinely and deeply concerned about each other. We're not just looking out for number one. It's not just me and Jesus, right? If that's what you are thinking Christianity is, 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 then you have sadly separated your Christianity from the truth of Scripture. Because nowhere in the Scriptures does it just teach that it's just you and Jesus. It's always you, Jesus, and His people, the church you belong to. We care about each other, which means we care about each other physically. We care about each other emotionally. We care about each other's spiritual well-being. We're to show a love that is wholehearted and practical. Jesus Himself, as He prayed for His church, said, And they will know you are mine by this that you study your Bibles really well, that you have an amazing quiet time, that you tithe and give to the church, that you don't swear, that you don't watch all those bad shows. No, he says, you will know you are mine by this, that you have love for one another. This isn't a faith of we can just live, uh, just, just me, Jesus, and my pious responsibility. No, friends, it's each other. Last week, we mentioned community groups being this place where discipleship happens. And I would point us again to community groups. Again, the purpose of these groups is not that we'd have a Bible study that we can check off the list, though certainly we do study God's word. No, instead, it's that we would be a family of disciples seeking to make disciples, that we would get to know each other, that we would invest in one another, and that we would catch this 
befriend each other. We're going to talk about friendships in a little bit, uh, in a couple weeks, but I, I just want to say this. I can't tell you how many people I know who are adults, who are deeply committed to the Lord, who love the church, and have no real friendships. Tons. When I was first starting out doing youth ministry, I remember one of my students talking to me and he said, hey, Billy, I don't want to grow up. And I was like, okay, well, like, you can't be a Toys R Us kid. What are you talking about, dude? He's like, I don't want to grow up because I, I, don't, I don't want to get old and not have any friends. He said he couldn't think of a single person who was a friend to his parents. His dad was a deacon in the church. His mom volunteered all over the place. No friends? Y'all, that's not good. That is not good. Listen, here is what images God to a watching world. A group of people who are committed to the kingdom. And that translates to a profound love for one another. You know how many times I talk to people who are just drawn in? They'll see us out and about at like a coffee shop. And they'll be like, who, who are you just hanging out with? I was like, oh, there's some folks from my church. And they're like, man, you guys, okay. You, know, you have friends? What's that like? The, when we see people who have seemingly nothing in common, I mean, people who are of different ages, different races, different social classes, different genders, coming together under the banner of Christ, it, it is attractive, it is appealing. Y'all, here's the hard truth. As believers, we should be the most welcoming and loving people on the planet, Period. We should be eager to gather together on Sundays, to gather together in each other's homes, to celebrate grace. Grace, friends, is the hospitality of God, to welcome sinners not because of their goodness, but because of His glory. If God chose not to magnify the glory of His own self-sufficiency and instead to enrich Himself by looking for talented and, and virtuous housemates, then there would be no grace in the world. There would be no hospitality. There would be no salvation. Friends, we owe our life, our eternal life to grace. And grace is God's disposition to glorify His freedom, His power, His wealth by doing what? Showing hospitality, showing welcome to sinners. So what do we do? We show hospitality. Perhaps one of my favorite things about hospitality and displaying grace is sharing a meal. I love it. There's something that comes to our minds when we think of hospitality. Almost immediately all of us think of food. Did you know that when you eat, you are rehearsing a gospel truth? The fact, friend, that you need something from outside of you to come inside of you and give you life is grace. This is why we push eating meals together at community groups. Because the Bible over and over again talks about the holiness of eating together. In fact, we're all longing and anticipating for a great big feast, are we not? You see, long dinners with good friends, good company, good conversations that center around our beliefs, our hopes, our fears, that's a good dinner. And the Bible says that's holy, that it images the meal that we are longing for. Now, we're going to come back to this idea of eating in just a little bit and how we can leverage that for the kingdom individually as the church scattered. But I want to say this. We have a high theology of food at Mission Church, right? Amen? We have a high theology of food. Because in a world that increasingly wants quick food and devalues meals together, we want to fight to enjoy the good gifts of God together. So as we talk about this idea of the church gathered, I want to say that we are going to fight to build a welcoming culture. Again, if we say that hospitality is the willingness to welcome people sacrificially, to welcome people who don't ordinarily belong there, that means that we are going to fight to make people feel welcomed, even if it makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable. That doesn't just mean that we invite people who we think we like and like what we like, but we invite those who are different than us. So I'd say if someone new comes in, sit with them, greet them. Here's a little pre-pandemic stat that still rattles me. This is a statistic about Burke County. On a Sunday morning, if you were to wager how many people you think don't attend a church, it's a little over 90,000 people in our county. Over 60,000 people in Burke County don't darken the door of a church. Now, that's surprising to some of us. Some of us are thinking, no, I knew that. But here's the deal. If somebody gets the gumption 
Because either they were invited, or maybe they Googled us, or maybe they just wandered in from the street. Let's be hospitable and welcome folks. What does that mean? It means here's a really easy task for you. Introduce yourself to someone new. Introduce yourself to someone new. There's nothing more awkward than walking into a church building, finding a seat, and then when we do our meet and greet time, just standing there awkwardly, like either thinking, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me, or who's going to talk to me, right? If you're like me, you're the psychopath that wants to talk, right? I want to say this too. If you don't know someone's name here, and it's like beyond the point where it's awkward, right? Today's a free pass for everyone, okay? If you don't know a name, you have immunity, right? When you meet someone today, even if you talk to them and known them for the last several years, introduce your name all over again. Hi, I'm Billy, right? Just free pass. This is why we, we think constantly to ourselves, how can we be welcoming? This is why we're putting signs up everywhere so that people know where to go. This is why we put a connect table out there with information on it. This is why we put coffee right by the door, That way you can get information, you can get a cup of coffee if you want it. This is why we put a really high emphasis on mission kids being a fun and inviting place to learn about Jesus. This is why we have things like kids check-in with safety precautions. Because we want people to know that not only are their kids having fun and learning about Jesus, but they're safe, they're secure. This is why we have connect cards so that people can get connected and learn about our church and learn about this gospel community. This is why you may have gone into the bathroom and wondered, why is there deodorant, right? Why are there breath mints in here? Because we want people to feel welcomed. There's nothing worse than showing up to the church being like, man, I took a shower and I completely forgot to put on deodorant. You don't have to worry about it, man. We got you, right? We want to say, hey, we have been welcomed by the king of the ages, Right When we see Jesus talk about what is God like, we cannot forget this. He doesn't describe God as this vengeful dictator in the sky that says, get it together. He says, I'll tell you what God's like. He's like a father who had a son who squandered everything. And when that son came crawling back, instead of looking at the son saying, "Uh uh-huh, come on back, you failure. No, God hikes up his garment, runs to his son, puts a robe on him, puts a ring on his finger and says, kill the fattened calf because our God is a God of welcome. And so we want to say, we've been showered with grace upon grace. And so, yeah, we're going to buy little Guatemala coffee, not Folgers, right? We're going to say in small ways, our God didn't cut corners to pursue me and I'm not going to cut corners to show you welcome. So we place gracious hospitality as a high value. We say that this is what the church gathered should be. But it's not just us corporately, friends. This translates over to you and me individually as well. So let's see second, the hospitality scattered. Hospitality scattered. Here's how we've defined this value as the church scattered. Living in diverse community, welcoming others into our gatherings, homes, and lives. As God's people, friends, we are called to operate not out of fear, but out of courage. Let me say that again. We are called to operate not out of fear, but out of courage. Too often we look at people who are different than us, people who maybe speak a different language, people who maybe don't own a home and live on the street, and we are afraid. That is not what Scripture calls us to. When we live courageously, when we put our hope in the reality of who Jesus is and what he has already accomplished, it changes everything. We're freed up to be the people of God, living out the mission of God, despite what new and challenging things may come our way. So when we talk about what it means to be courageous and faithful in the age of unbelief, we have to talk about the Great Commission. Jesus, before he ascends into glory, gives the Great Commission to go into the world and make disciples. That is our mission. And though it has always been true, I think it's more true than ever to say that evangelism in our post-Christian age is hard, right? It is difficult. The things that we did for a long time don't seem to work anymore, right? You can't just print out a bunch of tracks and go knocking door to door because people might shoot you, right? It's weird, Things are different. We live in a contentious time. So what do we do? Well, I think more and more in our post-Christian age, evangelism, the Great Commission is going to look like hospitality. 
That's right. Hospitality. As we walk courageously in our cultural climate, evangelism will look like showing hospitality. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that hospitality is the sum total of courage or evangelism. But don't miss me saying that living courageously will involve living hospitably. Now, hospitality might sound unexciting or initially feel confusing. But when the Bible speaks of hospitality, it almost always ties it to aliens and strangers. In other words, people who are not like you and me. When we come back to the idea that gracious hospitality means to give loving welcome to those outside of your normal circle of friends. It's opening your life, it's opening your home to those who believe differently than you do. And hospitality, friends, is all over the Bible. It is. In fact, it's so important to God that when Paul is listing out the traits necessary for a man to be qualified for the office of elder in the local congregation, this is what we read. 1 Timothy 3, verse 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. And so we ask, to be an elder, to be a pastor, a man has to be able to open his life and show kindness to those who believe differently than he does? Yes. He has to open up his world to those outside of what he believes and what he senses? Yes. This is Serious, friends, it really, really is. Erwin Lutzer says this, Hospitality is a test for godliness because those who are selfish do not like strangers, especially needy ones, to intrude upon their private lives. They prefer their own friends who share their lifestyle. Only the humble have the necessary resources to give of themselves to those who could never give of themselves in return. I hate election years. This is, this is off script now. I hate them. Do you know why? Because everybody loses their mind. I'm so glad we sang Ancient of Days because we live with this like narrow focus perspective of like right now is all that matters. We just did Ecclesiastes. And so maybe I'm still living in that a bit. Do you want to know what blows people's minds? When people who don't agree on anything get along. When you say, you know what, this person and their political opinion is banana sandwiches, right? I want nothing to do with it. And you say, but Jesus Christ loves them with a ferocious, never ending, never giving up, always pursuing love. So I'm going to love them too. Friends, why is the Bible so serious about hospitality? Again, because God has been hospitable to us. Even when we were living as his enemies, God came and saved us. Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus opened the door and invited us into God's presence. And we demonstrate that we truly appreciate and understand the divine hospitality we have received when we extend our own hospitality to those around us. I'm not suggesting that biblical hospitality is somehow this silver bullet for making evangelism work in the 21st century. Newsflash, there is no silver bullet. But might it not be in our cynical, polarizing, critical dumpster fire culture that a warm dose of welcoming, gracious hospitality will take some folks by surprise and open the door for opportunities to make disciples of Jesus? The following differentiation between hospitality and entertaining has really helped me. This lady, Karen Maines in the 70s, wrote this. Because this is what I think most of us think. We think hospitality, we think entertaining. She says, entertaining says, I want to impress you with my home, my clever decorating, my cooking. Hospitality, seeking to make much of Jesus, says, this home is a gift from my master, and so I'll use it as he desires. Hospitality aims to serve. Entertaining puts things before people. As soon as I get the house finished, as soon as I get the living room set up and decorated, when my house cleaning is done, then, then I'll start inviting people over. Hospitality puts people first. No furniture? Don't worry. We'll eat on the floor. The decorating may never get done. You come on in anyway. 
The house is a mess. I have kids and I'm a human being. But your friends, come home with us. Entertaining subtly declares, this home is mine. It's an expression of my personality. Look, please, and admire me. Hospitality whispers, what is mine is yours. Friends, Jesus has pursued us in love. He has welcomed us. Many of us need to look within and say, why am I so resistant to welcoming others? And so you may also be asking the question, what do you want me to do? Right? I think many of us feel that way when we hear sermons like this. And so I want to give us a couple quick ways that we can show hospitality. First, welcome everyone you meet. Welcome everyone you meet. What does that mean? I think the best thing that you can do is literally greet anyone you see. You know when you're at the gas pump and you do this whole like look down thing, don't look at anyone? What if you looked up and saw people? Hey, how's it going today? How you doing? It blows people's mind. They're like, you're talking to me? Usually people are surprised and delighted by that. Now, that's an easy thing to do if you're a grade A extrovert like me. And that's hard to do if you're an introvert. And right now, maybe you're thinking, can we just go to number two? Because I don't want to do that. But often the best things to do are the hardest things to do. This past week, I went into the UPS store. And I was going to take a laundry list of Amazon returns for the church and our house and I walk in the door, and it's just the humdrum of scanning and checking people out. And uh, my wife goes and does this at task usually all the time. And so they were, we, we were you know, recouping from being sick, and so um, they were still at home. And I was like, yeah, I'll take care of it. And I go in, and, and I'm sitting there, and I'm doing the whole routine process, and the guy's scanning everything. And I just go, oh, by the way, my son Sammy says hi because he loves the UPS store. And I'm not kidding. This guy went from just like dee dee to you're Sammy's dad? And I was like, this is weird. And I was like, yeah, I'm Sammy's dad. Yeah. He's like, oh man, how's Hannah? How's Sammy? He's like, did Sammy show you his drumstick? This guy has a drum set in the back of the store. And for some reason, let my kid go and play it. (laughs) And I love this because guys, if you don't, she's not here so I can pick on her. My wife is so good at talking to people. You know, I'm like, hey, let's go to Aldi real quick. No, I want to go to Food Lion. Why? Because so-and-so is working today. What? No, let's get, we're right here. But she wants to go because she wants to see people that she's connecting with because she's never met a stranger. You see, in our cold world of division, we can showcase mercy just by being kind. Pray for grace, ask for strength, and greet people. But don't just start there. Keep going. Second thing, engage people. Engage people. Remember this, every person you meet is eternal. I need to just, again... We're in a moment, in an age, in a culture, in a day where we villainize each other. We need to be reminded of a theological concept. So, yes, we shed our Latin name, but we're not going to shed teaching Latin. Here's a Latin phrase for you. Imago Dei. The image of God. You, friend, are an image bearer. God has crafted and made you in his image. And so is that fellow person. You have never met a mere mortal. And you have never met someone who doesn't bear God's image. So care about and take an interest in those you run across. And I don't think this is overly difficult. When I say engage, here's what I mean. Ask open-ended questions. Pray that you would let your inner curiosity out. Don't just be thinking about how you can talk about yourself. But ask God to give you a genuine curiosity for this image bearer, this person. You may think, well, this is all obvious, but so often we hold back from doing it. We do. Friends, we need to get to know people, to take an interest in them, to listen to them, rather than to just try and get them to think about how great you are and how you can say something maybe hilarious or something memorable. Get to know them. Engage people. Next thing, make meals a priority. Make meals a priority. This means we regularly eat meals with each other as a display of the love, provision, and acceptance of God. We, come, we, we can overcome idols like selfishness, giving up family time and extra costs to feed others. Maybe you pick a day of the week, hey, you know, Thursday nights, we're eating, we're eating anyways, let's always invite someone over to our home every Thursday. 
And you can let down idols like selfishness, right? Giving up that time, giving up resources, perfection, that the house is a mess, safety, they're not like me, control. <laughs> Folks show up and you can't control them, right? We, we lay down our lives and we invite people in, followers of Jesus or not, and we generously share good food, good drink with them. And when we do that, something very significant happens at that meal. Again, I said this earlier, think about this. We are hungry. We are in need. And that need is only met by something outside of our bodies. How amazing is it that Jesus himself calls himself the bread of life? Friends, we have a deep spiritual hunger that can be met only by Jesus. When people eat together, the experience is something more than just a physical event. There is a spiritual event taking place, whether people acknowledge it or not. God has provided a means to sustain life outside of our own lives. And whenever we eat, we are experiencing His care, His provision. The meal creates an experience of, of unity, of oneness at a table. I mean, this is why most business deals take place during meals and why more conversations happen when people have food or drinks in their hand. This is also why Jesus is called a friend of sinners. One theologian said it this way, Jesus eats his way through the Gospels because he identifies with people over a meal. When people ridiculed Zacchaeus, this scum of a human being who was stealing from God's people, who couldn't even get a view of Jesus, so he has to climb up in a sycamore tree, Jesus looks at him and says, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm coming to your house today. This is why we take communion. It's why the Lord's Supper, Supper is called communion, because it's a common meal eaten together to remind us of the common provision that we share in Jesus. We are one in our need and one in taking it. And so we have communion. I mean, Mission Church, hear me, you're already eating, hopefully at least three times a day. Don't do it alone. Do it with others and watch Jesus join you at the table and change that meal. He is well acquainted with joining people at the table. Invite Jesus and others to dinner and see what he does. And then lastly, love the outsider. Love the outsider. In every work environment, every neighborhood, there are people who are, for whatever reason, they're kind of outliers. These are men and women who are all around you, perhaps more so than ever in our globalized world, because of the way sin affects us, we tend to run away from people who are different than us. We tend to not want to be around people who think differently and look differently than us. But I want to lay this before you. Jesus Christ would have moved towards those people. How do I know that? Because he moved towards you. God extends radical, gracious hospitality to me and you. And we love the outsider because we were the outsider. Mission Church, would we bring the better wine? What do I mean by that? Jesus' first miracle is turning water into wine at a wedding feast. And it was so unusual, so perplexing, that when the host of the feast took of it, he said, this is way better. Who would do this? Usually people wait and bring out the worst stuff. Not Jesus. Jesus showcases Mercy and love to a divided and broken world. And as dark and dire as our landscape may appear right now, we know, friends, that the battle has already been won. And that means that we don't have to fight. This age of unbelief, it looks big, it looks intimidating for the church, but it's simply a small subplot in a bigger, better, greater story, the greatest story ever told. And while there are, yes, spiritual realities and significant things at work, we're called to simple, everyday faithfulness that works itself out in lives marked by hospitality. And sometimes, yes, it is the big flashy acts, the kind of stuff that we take pictures of and throw up online. But I'm convinced, friends, that our Christian courage looks more like inviting a group of strangers into your home for dinner than the attractive, successful ideas that we dream up in our minds. Would we open our homes? Would we risk getting hurt? Would we be courageous because of the hope, strength, and courage we get from the Lord? And today I don't want to just say this and leave you feeling encouraged and motivated and that just fade away. I want to give you a tangible task. So here's what we're going to do. 
I bought some gift cards. I'm going to pass these around. And there's one to Thornwell. There's one to Little Guatemala. It's 15 bucks. Everyone in the room gets one. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this gift card and I want you to connect with someone and invite them out for a cup of coffee. We could have spent this money on flyers that would go out into people's mailboxes saying, Mission Church, we're here. And they would have taken it, looked at it, and thrown it away. I don't want to invest my money that way. I don't want to invest the church's money that way. We want to invest in you, friend. Be hospitable. Welcome others in. Extend radical generosity. You see, one of the barriers that people have is, I don't know. I mean, I just don't, I don't know. I have the, things are tight right now. I don't know if I have the money. I don't really know what, what I could do or where we could go. Now, now you have no excuse, right? You literally have an opportunity. You see, rather than spending lots of money on Google ads or mailers that most people just throw away or scroll past, we want to invest in you. Share a good cup of coffee. Welcome people into your life. Invite them to your home. Invite them to this gathering. Invite them to community group. Showcase the great love of Jesus. There was a Chicago businessman that called his wife to get her, uh, to get her okay for bringing home a visitor. It was late in the day, and um, it was late in the day, and and she was kind of confused. She had just gotten her kids, and she was like, "What do you mean you want to bring someone home? What are you talking about?" Well, sweetie, he said, he is a a, a really important person from Spain, and he doesn't really speak a lot of English, but uh, I really want to feed him. (laughs) And she thought, well, this is going to be interesting. Uh, Yeah, sure, I'll figure something out for this Spanish official. So he comes, and they share a meal. They laugh, they have a good time, and they don't think anything of it as he leaves. Years later, they get a call from some friends that they're in Spain as missionaries, They had been brought to a standstill by government regulations. And all of a sudden, they get word from this Spanish official because he recognizes their last name. He realizes that they were family members of that hospitable Chicago couple. And so he did everything in his power. He used his influence to clear away the restrictions. This is true. There is a church today in that province of Spain because of one meal. Friends, how far can hospitality and kindness go? I mean, we may never know the great things that God will accomplish through selfless acts of his people. Show hospitality. It's a command, not an option. And let's do it with joy. Four questions for us. What does the hospitality of Jesus teach me about love? And how can I show that same kindness to others? Second, how can I use hospitality as a means of showing love and grace to others, especially those who might feel marginalized or overlooked in my community? Third, what are the simple, everyday ways I can be more welcoming to people around me? And fourth, Who will I take out for coffee? Again, we try to give you choices. I called called some guys this week as we were working through this. Uh, We have some men who are going through our our elder process. And I said, hey, guys, what do you think? Where should we go? This place or this place? And they're like, both. Give them options. Give them choices. So pick one or the other and pray about who God would have you show hospitality to. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are overwhelmed because you have welcomed us. You have pursued us in love. You have shown us grace upon grace upon grace. And you have called us to live lives of holiness. You have called us to live lives of welcome. Lord, would we be those who extend the compassion of Jesus? Would we be those who welcome others into our home? I pray, God, over these gift cards. I pray for courage for these people. Thank you, God, for the ways that you're working. I pray that you would stir someone to mind, Lord. If they don't know who, then this week you would surprise and delight them. And that, Lord, we pray for good conversations. We pray, Lord, that you would would work. Lord, that you would go ahead of us, Lord, and that you would extend the welcome through us, Lord. God, we're so grateful for the hope that we have been shown in Jesus. 
We pray all of this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.